the Germans picked their time when to attack, we would be in what we call Hell's Pass, and it wasn't far off the British coastline. Their aircraft used to come out from France or Norway, and the submarines would be there, and then they'd start their attack in the convoy. And uh, I saw, for instance, a tanker, and she'd go up in flames, right? And you could see men jumping off that ship all on fire, they had no hope whatsoever. And it would go up like a big fireball. And then, that, then there was other ships that were sunk, fully laden with tanks and trucks and things like that. And that heavy laden, they go straight down within a matter of minutes. No hope for the crew, because don't forget, in the North Atlantic, it was so cold, you know, they, they didn't stand a chance, you know. And we was attacked like that every day for, you know, for three or four days before we get in line with the British coast. And then the Air Force, the Royal Air Force at that time, the Spitfires used to come out and the, 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 naturally the German planes took off back to their bases. But out of 60 ships, we 40 got through. That's how I can tell you the story of a convoy and how they were attacked for days on end, day and night, no, no redress whatsoever. And that's how we lived right through the six years of war. No, it's not the Royal Navy, but the unheralded Merchant Navy, which was comprised of all commercial ships enlisted to aid the Allied war effort, including the Otranto, on whom William Andrews served during the Second World War. That the three armed forces couldn't go anywhere without the Merchant Navy. We had to carry the troops, we had to carry the armaments, everything, oh yes, everything to do with war. And this is why people today do, do not understand what the Merchant Navy stood for. It, it, if it wasn't for the Merchant Navy, the armed forces couldn't go anywhere. For instance, I was involved in the landings at Sicily, in the landings at Salerno in Italy, and we carried about between four and 5,000 troops. We lost hundreds of ships every day. In order to let people know about the heroic sacrifice of merchant Navy seamen, Mr Andrews has written a book, Under the Southern Cross, which he hopes will elevate the status of the merchant Navy alongside that of the other armed forces. I was brought up in the naval school, so you know, from an age of five years old till I was 14. So uh, that was the idea. You went to sea, either in the Royal Navy or in the Merchant Navy. And we was always taught that the Royal Navy and the, Na and the Merchant Navy were one brotherhood. And I've always believed in that, that in, especially during the war, the Royal Navy and, and the Merchant Navy, or like in Australia, the RAN and the Merchant Navy were one brotherhood. We worked and we died together and we lost plenty of people. In fact, I can tell you in the Atlantic War, just in the Atlantic War, we lost over 55,000 men. All told, I can tell you the exact figure, the Allied navies, the Merchant Navies lost and this is the, including the fishing fleets, they lost about 11,400 ships in the Second World War. A lot of people don't understand this. You see, unfortunately, the Merchant Navy was always classed as civilians, you know, never part of the armed forces. That's the message I've been trying to get out, and that was the reason I wrote this book, was to try and get this message out to ordinary Australians. So that, and New Zealanders and worldwide, I want to get this message out so that they understand more fully what the Merchant Navy was about. Launched recently by the Maritime Union of Australia, Under the Southern Cross tells the experiences of Mr Andrews and other merchant sailors. It uses the fictitious character John Ward and his search for his brother in order to tell the story from an Australian perspective. Mr Andrews' home for many years. I came to Australia three times. The first time was bringing the troops home, 
I bought the first lot of prisoners of war, Australian and New Zealanders, that were prisoners of war in Germany at the end of 1944. The second time I jumped a ship, we ended up, I think it's the first riggers up there on the Snowy Mountain scheme, <laughs> my mate and I. And then eventually when I got back to England, I had to face the music about jumping the ship. So I went back to the shipping office and the shipping master says to me, you can go on any ship, but you can't go on any ship going to Australia for two years. That's yeah. what he said. So I ended up going to the west coast of Africa, <laughs> where I caught malaria there. So eventually, the third time coming to Australia, I said to my sister, I'm going to Australia permanently this time. And I paid my own passage. And I arrived in Australia then for the third time in 1953. I married in 1954 at Rutherglen, a place called Rutherglen, to an Australian girl. We had six children and 23 grandchildren now and four great-grandchildren, another one on the way at the moment. In part two, we hear about William Andrews' growing political consciousness. After the war, when we came back, that's when I got into a political frame of mind. His time on the tugs on Victoria's western port. Everything we got in our industry, we had to fight all the way for. And much more. Flags of convenience, trade union movement, all that sort of stuff. I've tried to condense in a small book. That's my, how I looked at the industry that I served for 45 years. <laughs>